Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Acidburn Sarkeesian. And I'm Cat Crash Override Spada. And today, our summer of cyberpunk comes to an end. Mr. Deckard, Dr. Eldon Terrell. The new millennium. This is amazing. We'll bring a new experience. How do you fit all that in your head anyway? I had to dump a chunk of long-term memory. This is going to be fun, Terry. Who is this? Take this thing out of the case and stick it up your nose. Mozart's Ghost, the hottest band on the internet! So what better time to harken back to the Hacker's Manifesto from 1986, published in the e-zine Frack. In part, the manifesto reads... And then it happened. A door opened to a world rushing through the phone line like heroin through an addict's veins. An electronic pulse is sent out. A refuge from the day-to-day incompetencies is sought. This is our world now. The world of the electron and the switch. The beauty of the bod. To round out this season, the final film we are discussing is Hackers, of course, a 1995 crime thriller, I guess, from director Ian Softley. A crew of high school hackers led by Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie find themselves involved in a corporate conspiracy in this movie that has become a cult classic in the nearly three decades since its release. Its screenwriter Raphael Moreau said, To call hackers a counterculture makes it sound like they're a transitory thing. I think they're the next step in human evolution. He's about to commit the perfect computer crime. You've created a virus that's going to cause a worldwide disaster. And they're about to take the blame. A hacker planted the virus. (laughs) But it's the perfect cover. We're being framed. Can we be allies? I don't play well with others. Oh, wow, we are fried. Okay, let's nail it. You're not good enough to beat me. Yeah, maybe I'm not. But we are. They're the only ones who can prevent a catastrophe. I know how to stop this guy. They'll trace you like that. Are you nuts? Come at me! Unlike any the world has ever seen. Never send a boy to do a woman's job. Hackers of the world unite. Cops on the building. I need more time. This is the end, my friend. Joining us to discuss this film is an Emmy and Wendy's Employee of the Month winning television writer and producer who specializes in Montana hillbilly trauma comedy. She created the animated series Danger and Eggs and has worked on movies and television series, including Yo Gabba Gabba, Brightburn, 12 Forever, and Forever Alone. She is a writer on the long-anticipated Netflix adaptation of The Sandman, which debuted this summer. Welcome to the show, Shadi Podosky. Thank you. I am so excited to have you on. I'm excited to be here. I I did watch this movie, so this, that's, <laughs> that's all you got. Uh, I, no, I, I love this movie. This is going to be great. Um, what, you said that we're supposed to be critical, but I don't know if I can. I just like it so much. You don't have to be. You could just be like, this is the best thing that's ever been made. It the is whole so world. sweet. Yeah, <laughs> I just love it. Um, have you seen this movie before? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah uh, classic. Yeah, I saw it when it came out. Cat, have you seen the movie before? before? I'm shocked that I have not seen this what? movie until last night. It's like one of those movies that I feel like, oh, I know that movie. You know, like I know it's Angelina Jolie and the Pixie Cut and they're hacking and hack the planet. But then like when I actually sat down, I was like, I don't think I've ever watched this. Um, but it's like definitive. I mean, this is like the 90s vibe and aesthetic I'm looking for. I am kind of stoked that it just accidentally happened that this is our last episode because I so I've seen this movie a bunch of times I really wasn't looking forward to seeing it again I was like I've seen hackers enough I don't need to see it ever again but as I was watching it I was like this is to me like the quintessential cyberpunk movie like it has all the aesthetic all the story all the elements that make cyberpunk what it is like especially of like the 90s genre of cyberpunk so i feel like it's a nice container for the season that we're doing yeah and i've been hacking the planet for 20 years so i haven't <laughs> thought about it yeah until now. yeah you've or just 30 been years. doing 30 it. years oh, <laughs> time time slips by it's like being in a hacking the planet's like being in a casino you just don't know what time it is yeah so um you know, I, I think on a previous episode, I was talking about how there's like the cyberpunk movies where it's like, 
technology is the worst and the bad mm. and like techno fear. And then there's the ones where it's like, we are the activists who are going to save the day with our hacking skills. And like, that is the the zone that this movie is in that I like, I appreciate the, we are just like misunderstood, but we're really good for you. You know, <laughs> we're taking down the man. That's all I ever want. I don't ever want to see a killer robot or any <laughs> computer thing being bad because none of us have had bad experiences with computers or digital <laughs> culture or anything. Like I, I want it all. I'm like pro Google Glasses, and I get upset when people are anti anything. I just want it. I want it all to happen. I'm very much more in that hacker manifesto vibe of like let the information be free and let the stuff get made, and you know. It could be bad, but I don't want it. To, I don't want it to be bad. I got so, really angry at that robot Black Mirror episode. I'm like, no, those dogs, <laughs> those dogs are going to bring me Lucky Charms. That's just what those dogs are going to do. And it's going to be great. I lived in San Francisco when Google Glass was a thing and I was fucking horrified. Like I would see people on the subway wearing them and I'd just immediately be like, don't look at me. Don't look at my face. You're not allowed to see me with your fucking corporate advertising spyware. And so we start this podcast as enemies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why I invited you, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, I did. I um, will uh, bookend us by saying that Shaddy missed out on the first movie we discussed this season, Johnny Mnemonic, in which a psychic dolphin uh, is responsible for like transmitting, I mean, not psychic, but who cares, uh, transmitting information to the VCRs of the public. Incredible. I did watch <laughs> Johnny Mnemonic in quarantine. So I'm up to, <laughs> I'm so if we sorry. wanted to we'll cover them all. I know. Well, that's really like a cyberpunk movie that was trying, because it's a William Gibson movie. So that's where they're really trying to be like cyberpunk, whereas Hackers is not like it's not it's not speculative fiction right it's more like ethnographic or they wanted it to be like it's about 1995 and what was happening with the people at that time and what could maybe happen a little bit but mostly it was kind of about it's like to me it's like the same as a skateboarding movie or like empire mm. records came out that year so it's, it's just it's like oh you've got your record shop workers movie that have to save the record store and you've got your hackers movie and you've got gleaming the cube to me it's like just those kind of movies and it's not like you know, J.G. Ballard, William Gibson. Yeah, it's not like speculative futuristic. fiction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they weren't even trying to, to be really. I mean, they did visually. We can talk about that later. But to me, it's just a totally different movie. But it is a cyberpunk. Well, movie. Yeah, I mean, let's get into it's the visuals. Better. I like. I find so much joy in the visuals of this movie. I think, and again, I think it is like part for me part of what I'm like. Why I think this is quintessential cyberpunk. Like the reflection of code on their faces oh. while they're like sitting at their computers. I was like, yes, please. The fucking um, just the like the hacking sequences that are way too long, where it's just like Johnny Lee, Johnny. Johnny Lee Miller spinning around with like in the digital sphere and you're like I'm in the computer the spinning was the best <laughs> it was the best spinning and Sp uh, Twilight later had spinning as well but this Twilight? movie well, Twilight has some calendar spinning but like this movie oh, the right. the um the the phone booth spinning was amazing like I, I don't know. I, I, this movie may have invented spinning. It definitely, <laughs> it definitely was like the first movie I think where it was like techno over uh, computer, like looking up something, right? Like this is right. the movie that was like, and now that always happens. Like that, and every anytime you have somebody on a computer doing something, like it's hackers like, over and over again. So I feel like this movie really changed filmmaking <laughs> in general, <laughs> in general, and inspired everybody after. Okay. Yeah, the I mean, we'll get there, but the whole like phone booth thing at the end too. That was the only moment of like techno fear that I thought was when there's like people going to work, and it it made me feel like you could be on your way to the office, and there could be a hacker right behind you. Like there was just something about like hacking; it's all around us. Like that was. But in the movie, it's not like you you shouldn't be afraid of that. It's like you should be afraid of the hacker you can't see who's in the top floor of the building. Um, and the only other question I had about a visual, there were these like cubes of code, I guess, that were supposed to be like servers or something. Yeah. And they were just these like light installations. And I loved it. I was like, that's very cool. I hope whoever designed that for this movie kept it for their home. I 
I loved when they were flying and he was looking out the window and it was like the the buildings turned into like like motherboard and like computer that things. was beautiful <laughs> I was like this is so how good he sees the world man <laughs> it's it's so good and all that stuff is like practical right so the that's kind of famous for like they didn't use like the lawnmower man or the johnny mnemonic cg stuff they just built little models and built all that stuff in the old school way so that stuff it could be in somebody's living room right because it all exists which yeah. is just so amazing because it felt like with that stuff and the you know they did all the movie flashback stuff um when he was sort of hyper focused or whatever he's thinking about classic films and things mm. it, i worked on yo gabba gabba for 75 episodes so it felt a lot like that to me where it was just like artists just doing whatever they could get done as cheap as possible and you know somebody tried this one and you just assigned a bunch of artists and i think it was that and then like um it was just all these independent special effects people doing what they could do with no money and then they formed like a huge vfx company after that like it seems very artists everything about this movie is just like a bunch of artists throwing what they have at the wall which is amazing and i think that's really part of the hacker reality in the yeah. mid 90s too is that like i mean i kind of know this like from cultural osmosis but watching it where i'm like yeah it was a lot more analog at the time. Like hacking started with holding a tape recorder up to a payphone. Like that is hacking and it feels so like, wait, no, that's not hacking. That's not like having to understand how to break down code. It's like, but yeah, it is. And it started that way. I mean, there's obviously, uh, it's delightful for me, especially never having seen this movie before to see like Johnny Lee Miller stashing his like floppy disks in his <laughs> pants and stuff. But like, I mean, what's the difference between that and like uh, an external hard drive? It just holds a lot more, but it's the same like physical digital overlap. I will say that they all used Apple computers, which you were, no one was hacking on an Apple. And I no, think it's really true. funny because like, you know, you'd be using like Linux, like, or you'd be like typing into code on like DOS commands and stuff. But because Apple was the visual UI at the time, uh, I think that it was probably more appealing from a filmmaking perspective because you could like see windows opening and shit mm. like that, even though that wasn't at all what you would ever be hacking on at that moment in, <laughs> in history. That was super weird. It's just what you used at school. Um, yeah. But yeah, the um, hackers are like, click the hack button on Apple TVs or whatever. Okay, so the movie starts in Seattle, 1988, where a Mr. Zero Cool, who is like a fucking infant, uh, <laughs> took down uh, 1,508, I don't fucking remember the number. Seven. Sis seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> he corrects um, him in the middle. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. 1,507. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and then is not allowed to touch anything like electronic for until he's 18 or whatever. And so I'm like, but then he like, you know, goes to a new school and finds all these cool people and is just like, I am like master elite hacker. And I'm like, how the fuck would you know how to do anything? Like so much has changed in the technological evolution of uh, 18, well, whatever, 10, 10 year, more than whatever, be like 10 years or something. Yeah. Um, I, that that I, you know whatever there's so many things you have to forgive in the story but that I just kept like harping on being like how do you fucking know how to do anything anymore man oh I have an explanation because remember when they brought out the when, books the books later the Crayola books so he's been studying and doing it and then there's a moment when he because he turns 18 and so he can go online and he goes he goes into the uh, hacks the tv station are you gonna go through the plot points of the movie I don't or are we just you are no gonna, oh, okay. i mean we can talk about that but there, yeah yeah there's no uh, official structure this podcast is very willy-nilly <laughs> and his mom who's awesome she's the best mom but she says like you connected to the phone line so she freaks out because he connected to the phone line so so he's been using a computer this whole time he just hasn't connected it until his 18th birthday so i think he's been like itching itching yeah. to go yeah he's raring. only gaming on cd-roms i guess like yeah. everything's I I loved that scene where he calls the security guard and is like, Mr. Eddie Vedder from accounting, the BLT drive and da da da. And like, I love that it was so obvious that even if you don't know anything about computers, you're like, I know those references. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> that's that's like the big geek, the IT Dilbert. He, although Dilbert did not, does not still hold up, but that was the whole thing. Like 
the CD-ROM is the cup holder or the weird, right. like, it's the, that's the biggest joke. But yeah, I remember when he said this is Eddie Vedder and I was just like screaming <laughs> when yeah, in the 90s. Yeah, you're like, that's it's so It's like, funny. he's so cool, you guys, <laughs> and he tricked, oh my God, yeah. And that's like, uh, well, that's the great thing because that's like social engineering, right? Which is how a lot of hacking is done. And so uh, it, you know, that the movie's great because it shows that, it shows dumpster diving, it shows all this like infiltration stuff. And it, sh it show it really is, is like this is how hacking is done is like those tricky phone calls and stuff and not just you know people typing in yeah code or whatever. I, I think one of the things that's uh a little disappointing to me is that it's like hacker versus hacker mm. uh instead like the corporation isn't evil it's just this one guy in the corporation that's evil um which you know whatever that makes a fine story but i love a i love a takedown corporation story and so it was like you know whoever this company was uh, wasn't a bad company. It was just this one guy who was like embezzling money from them that was like, I'm going to sink tankers and kill all of these people. And you're like, damn, dude, that's like bad. <laughs> right. You think that the bad guy is the guy from The Wire and then the FBI agent. And then <laughs> it turns out it's it was Fisher Stevens and Lorraine Bracco all along. And I know I'm jumping straight to the end, but the scene where Lorraine Bracco, is that Lorraine Bracco, right? From The Sopranos? His girlfriend, the like, is that what she's? Is I recognize her, but I couldn't. I don't remember her name. Anyway, yeah, she's just slept with Fisher Stevens in his like metal origami bed. And what the fuck that bed? <laughs> I was like, that looks so uncomfortable. <laughs> she sees like Matthew Lillard on the TV, and then she's like, "Oh my god!" And immediately, I was like, "Oh shit!" Fisher Stevens hacked his way out of that bedroom instantly. He is gone. He's got himself to the wig store. He is ready to get to the Grand Caymans or whatever. Um, there was, I mean, this movie's hilarious, I think on purpose, right? Like most of it, I didn't feel like at, when I was laughing, most of the time I felt like I was laughing with the movie, not at the movie. So Yeah, it's essential to know that that's a comedy, right? Like I've seen yeah. other people talk about hackers as if it's just corny, but everything was so, it was all intentional jokes. And it's a really cartoony movie, like the way they cut and then they pop in with, jokes all the time but it is an anti-cop movie like it's not uh all you know like um the secret service are the bad guys so they do take them down too sort of but they're but they're doing the bidding of the corporation mm -hmm. so it's yeah. kind and of they a... do they do make fun of like the movie makes fun of him too right having him yeah. be like and and the press you called are here sir and then him saying the same thing over and over again about hackers being evil and you're like ah, you're a wanker <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna get you yeah so um, i love I love that part about it but to your point about it not being hacker versus hacker it would have been better if it was like the corporation abusing some poor hacker versus hacker. But but then I'm going to step back. What I was saying is like, okay, so if we accept that it is a hacker versus hacker story, which I suppose we have to, if we want to remain rooted in this current reality, um, then like, it is kind of cool to be like, who is better? You know, like it, like the, the hacker off between uh, Angelina Jolie and Dade I thought was fucking delightful like the so sort of cool. prepping for it and like seeing who can outwit each other like I loved I loved that it was so geeky and nerdy and like I, I you know so the, I think that that little microcosm of the hacker off is like the larger uh, casing of the movie right is like yeah. and, and our and who's using hacking for good and who's using it for bad you know like you have Razor and Blade that come in that are like the most elite uh, the most performative that are like hacking is more than just a crime. It's a survival trait. Right? <laughs> uh, and like, they're like, let's bring everyone together and like take down this bad guy with the collective, right. With a, with a collective of pe of hackers who are all in it to beat a family or whatever. And yeah. I'm, I'm into the relationships, like uh, the whole little crew in the high school. First of all, like the, the fact that you hear the kid who wears the little kitten t-shirt and he's like calling his family in Venezuela, like he's kind of your way into this group. Matthew Lillard, like it does feel really lived in that like he would be crashing on this guy's couch and that Angelina Jolie's family, like she, her mom's a self-help writer and then she has all this money, but it was like, I actually, I really wish I'd seen this when I was younger because I loved, um, 
the way that their relationship was like they were both kind of horny for each other. There was the little bet that didn't feel like a gross exploitative bet as usually does in 90s teen movies. I, um, I would say it was still kind of <laughs> gross, but not as bad as some not of the other ones. Bad. Although, All, every time we're watching 90s movies, I'm picking crumbs. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. Be a morsel well, okay. of respect. <laughs> so, so a couple of things. One, as a teenage queer, when like you know, ish, when this came out, like every Angelina Jolie movie at that time was, we were all watching as much as we could of it. So, like you had uh, Foxfire, um, you had um, Gia. I don't know, Gia came Gia, out a little yeah. bit later, like, and it was just like she was just like the queer idol for for. Every- a lot of people at the time uh i looking at her now i'm like you look like shit in this whole movie that haircut is the fucking worst but oh man uh, i didn't think so I i'm she sure was i'm coolest. sure i'm in the minority i wanted to this. be her so bad and it As was like kid, the first yeah. thing yeah. that she did too so it was like she did kind of come out of nowhere as this otherworldly person i, I do think genius. with the bet there's a couple of interesting things, right? It does fit into the, like, do you have to date me if you lose? And she's like, well, I'm not going to lose. And then you're, she's like, well, you have to wear a dress. And he's like, well, okay. And she was, you know, whatever that whole thing happens. And you're like, oh, is this like veering on some fucked up shit? But the fact that she has a sex dream about him in a dress that's yeah. super erotic. I was like, I'm okay with like, this feels like fantasy fulfilling and not like making fun of despite the fact that there is a shitty trans joke in the movie, right? Like that didn't feel like that didn't feel shitty in the way it was framed. Uh, I don't know. Agree. Disagree. I, it felt, I mean, it like, it felt like it was definitely written by a dude, a straight dude with like the battle of the sexes, Mm -hmm. like argumentative, like we don't like each other. We're just going to win. Like, I guess that's like a straight relationship is just hating each other. (laughs) And, uh, you know, hating each other until one of you pins the other or exhausts the other or whatever. And they're really like, you know, it, it, again, we're jumping to the end, but like, he doesn't win, but the dudes just vote for him so that he can have the date. Like, it's all right. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, but, but I did love uh, the part, her having the dream did feel like kind of the feminist moment where he's like, oh, he's going to give her the dream too. And then it was like, oh, they're hot for each other and this is all okay. Yeah. yeah. And so the and date does, would have happened one way or another at that point, even if it was yeah, like set up in those. Yeah. And what I definitely you- was hoping for a tie. I thought they were going to both show up to the date at the end in like pleather dresses. I was fully expecting that and was definitely disappointed that it wasn't. That's a better case. movie for sure. Yeah. yeah. Although yeah. what he's wearing <laughs> is fun. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's a little... I mean, the fact that the whole credit sequence is them just fucking in a pool. <laughs> I was like, oh, right. I forgot about this. Okay. Like, moment, this literally just goes on and on. And you're like, okay. This the movie's moment very after horny. Her sex dream, when she opens up her locker, never forget we're in high school. She opens up her locker and there's like a little, you know, Fredericks of Hollywood thing inside. And she's like, I'm ready for our date if you are. And he gives her this look like, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna win I'm not gonna wear that and I thought like oh no he definitely bought his like one-legged red l- holster that matches his pager in the men's section like let's not let's be clear about a uh, crash override here um I thought she looked incredible I was definitely watching this like I could pull off those little bangs <laughs> which I could not um but I'd love to like hold this movie up against any number of nepotism babies, like first films that they're in when they're a teenager and you're like, oh, so-and-so's kid is going to be in a movie. This is going to be crappy. And then you end up with the occasional Angelina Jolie out of it. I, as I was watching it, I couldn't reconcile Johnny Lee Miller as Crash Override and Johnny Lee Miller as Sherlock Holmes. Like I (laughs) longtime listeners of the podcast know that me and Ebony fucking loved elementary. And like, I just, I kept being like, it was like a, a tear was happening in my brain trying to remedy the fact that these are both the same human beings. (laughs) And I don't know why that was so hard for me, but yeah, it was just, it was such a, well, people people grow up and play different roles and like it's, but just, they're both so quintessential in my mind as like distinct separate separate roles i don't know i've always just seen train spotting with him yeah which is completely different too right like that's a wild one no he's a a little chameleon 
Um, one other, yeah, that's true. Actually, I I would totally agree with that. One other little fun fact is that um, the game that they're playing in the arcade is like a CGI version of Wipeout that had not come out yet, I believe, or was like coming out that year that they made specifically for the movie. And I love the high score action sequence where it's like stomp, the names are like stomping on each other's names. I was like, man, I wish video games really had that kind of dramatic high score mechanism. Just such an aggressive fuck you high score. Yeah. And just yeah. like that arcade, I was like, man, I wish I had cool places like that to hang out in as a teenager. Yeah. Perfect. It's so good. It didn't exist. I don't know if you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was just for the movie. That was very much like the uh, the aspirational thing. But that's kind of how, because we've been talking about the costumes, it's like this movie, all of it, like hackers suck, right? Like, like uh so it talked about the the costume designer talked about um going to a hacker convention to get like inspiration and figure it out but everybody was just wearing black and so bored <laughs> yeah. And like, oh. yeah so this is a film where all of these departments studied and did deep dives and and wanted to like understand this world and represent it visually and they all were just like this world is boring we're just gonna do what we think is cool and everybody just did what they thought it was cool and that was like you know, the hangout that it just was all. It's and that's perfect. the thing about all tech, like tech representation in movies, like, like any kind of programming is fucking boring. Like it's not, it is not visually interesting or dramatic. And I think that's where a lot of this comes out of, of like, yeah, we're going to like spin around in a, in a wheelie chair and put some graphics over your face. And like, there's so many pans of like the fingers typing up to the Apple logo, up to the computer screen and then cut. And then like that again and again. And so like making tech visual, I think is a part of what's the cyberpunk genre like brought into this space and then making them be like cool and counterculture, which, you know, you're like, is not most of the programmers I know wear like t-shirts they got from video game conventions <laughs> or like their workplaces and jeans, you know, like they're not <laughs> stereotype. I realize I'm saying that, but like, it's, it's not the most fashionable bunch of people. Not yeah. an all white one, oh, one piece unitard. So good. So good. All right. So I want to ask you all about something I read about when researching this movie, which was I'm, pretty sure this was just a marketing ploy but i still don't have the answer which is the uh mgm united artists website for the movie hackers which was allegedly hacked by a group called the internet liberation front um and then it was like stayed up throughout the run of the movie being in theaters as an altered site and uh don't worry i have it for you there's no um there's no audio oh, Are you going to show audio it? Can you here? Just, share it? just Incredible. so you can see <laughs> the hacking of this movie poster that's done for our listeners. It's like an MS Paint style doodling over Angelina Jolie and Johnny Lee Miller. And then, oh my god, this text! <laughs> yeah, uh, it says this is going to be a lame, cheesy promotional site for a movie. Um, that's uh, yeah that's it and then it's like don't watch this movie instead you should check out real hacker sites or or re read frack magazine which is like the the uh e magazine for frackers for frackers for hackers <laughs> um for, <laughs> rupaul weekly is the Wait. is the magazine for frackers um yeah uh knowledge isn't free don't hack the planet don't see hackers it sucks buy teach yourself c in 21 days instead Raphael Moreau, screenwriter, must Man, die. Man, this would be such a good marketing scheme. It I mean, must I'm, be. I'm sure it was. I, I know yeah. the story, and and but they left it up. Yeah, and they yeah. could have. They could have done it. But also, were there movie websites a lot in 1995? I feel like no. Probably not a lot, but I think they were. I mean, the Space Jam website that's iconic um, was probably what 96. Okay. Um, which if you haven't seen that, we should also link that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was, yeah, lovely. this just feels like somebody's like, let's have the hype site be happy. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a, I mean, it is offen- like it is pretty. Offensive. But also <laughs> like having them link to like actual hacker stuff, if those links are actually active, I think is kind of cool if it's just a marketing blitz, you know? Yeah. And Unle- I know unless that- the community didn't want that then not cool but in the credits of the movie uh they thank the writer of the hacker manifesto and include his email address mentor oh at blankenship.com is in the credits i i don't know i didn't think there was gonna be a stinger or something i just like let the credits play to the end and i was shocked just to see like an an at email address in the movie credits i wonder how many people watch this and were like at you know, dear mentor at blankenship.com. I want to learn how to hack the planet. Yeah. Wild. Wild. Sucks for him. That would have been annoying, probably. <laughs> or, <laughs> or they loved it. Uh, who knows? Yeah, that's um, true. I the last thing I just like want to. He oh. likes attention. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah. I feel like you've got it if to write a manifesto, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it's an attention getting thing, usually. Yeah. You shoot yeah. somebody, you blow somebody up. It's all. It's yeah. Yeah. You write a manifesto. It's all the same. I've written um, a few. My therapist just says to delete them before the <laughs> <end>. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the la- The last like sort of representational thing I want to point out is that this is a movie of like the one hot, cool hacker chick lady, mm. right? Like that. This is a recurring theme that when women do get included in these stories, they get to be like, like one of the guys and there are no other women as competition and they are also like a love interest typically in some some capacity so this definitely fits squarely into that trope oh yeah and yeah. maybe helped invent it a little bit well i don't know these that's probably been in 70s motorcycle movies or whatever <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yeah, right. Probably. it's uh it's all that she you know she's not fixing the engine but She's hacking. I guess she's fixing the engine. Um, how would you react if your date uh, lit up a bunch of building windows to love your names? Love. I wouldn't. I don't think anybody would react like her because that laugh was ridiculous. <laughs> like the joy that she expressed was so confusing. It's it like, just went on and on and on. Because it's like, look, three weeks ago, you guys managed to get to the antenna towers on top of the Empire State Building. Lighting so up cool. some office building windows ain't nothing compared to that. <laughs> I love the lighting up of the windows uh, so much. Um, I just, I would love that. I think that shit's so much fun. Uh, but I like immersive installation shit like that uh one one thing that i <laughs> this is so stupid uh he's like and if you go on a date with me you have to smile and then literally yeah. the next scene she's like laughing and smiling and you're like huh cool mm. great like doesn't matter things that i notice whatever yeah <sighs> i'll wear a dress yeah this movie you know be pretty. you know it's like street harassment and yeah. In a movie, uh, not in a movie, whatever. Okay, everybody, I'm I mean, gonna people, stop talking. Well, no, but it is, yeah, it's it it is exactly that. It's very '90s. It's very today. It's very all time. Yeah. And so, I th- and I I don't like like people will talk about it as being this kind of like gender free and gender queer movie because there's sort of some color on the clothes. But to me, like like aside from like the Vivian Westwood mashup of all the clothes like all the clothes are super utilitarian it's all Mm. like work clothes or motorcycle jackets or like military molly bag type things um except for angelina has the the surfer rash guard but that's like that's still very utilitarian so except for the dress at the end it's all like really like mask utility piled on of more mask utility so to me it's like this isn't even like what are we this is not gender queer this is not like this is just a very like mask fashion it's the same thing as like what you know like the sex pistols you know it's just like right you know uh because it's it's punk and he was like trying to do that vivian westwood thing with the the mashups and stuff but it's like everything he chose was utility and nothing was femme or ornamental or like additive really except for like i guess um serial four pigtails or something yeah <laughs> i was hoping that we'd get that we'd come to matthew lillard serial serial killer um spelled for the Loops. way you're thinking and uh he was by the way a delight i was i loved it i loved him in this movie 
this is the first movie I ever saw him in, and it was like, this is the greatest person ever. Like, it was, he was amazing. He was so amazing. Yeah. And then he became, <laughs> he became Matthew Lillard, but it was just like, <laughs> Yeah, he want, who doesn't want to be friends? I don't know now if you want to be friends with Matthew Lillard. He might um, ask for you a know. lot of rides. Uh, <laughs> to the but, like, you know, yeah, it's, like, so cool. He's so cool. Ugh. I feel like, uh, you know, uh, representation, there are some representational issues that I find troubling. But overall, the movie is, like, pretty solid like it holds up it's still like got a really good core the like pacing of it's overall pretty good like it look it still looks interesting so i feel like this was a like a fun one to revisit yeah it's not I feel, super I, like, uh, yeah. offensive it, and that's part of like that hacker manifesto right it was like i don't i can't quote it but it was just like no race no gender no mm -hmm. you know the handles are are beyond that and that was kind of the idea in the early internet that <laughs> it didn't it didn't work out this way what but, uh yeah yeah uh yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. it was gonna all be this this yeah uh but i think i think he was trying for that right like he he was you know it was cast the, the group of friends is mostly white but there's two black or there's the black guy and then there's uh, you know we're still living yeah. in uh, our current reality when they cast it so you can you can go too extreme right with, right, right you know yeah. But it definitely felt like the filmmakers were thinking about all of that and wanted to make sure that that happened. And, you know, yeah, there was representation that made that Empire Records didn't have, you know. Yeah, that's true. Like the same year. I was. keep I keep thinking about Empire Records. I was fucking obsessed with it as a kid and I'm afraid to go back and rewatch it. I'm like, does it? I don't know if it holds up if it. All I think about is Empire Records. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I loved it so much. I mean, it's you know it's it's rapey it's like it's, yeah it's yeah. not yeah but it's uh i mean these movies are all these like all late 80s 90s it's all just these cool teen hangout movies and it was like at all these aspirational group of friends and yeah. empire records is one i think about is like a series of vignettes like that i don't even really feel connected to each other i'm like there's rex manning there's the robin tunney shaving her head there's the rooftop, you know, but I don't necessarily feel like they need to even be in the same universe. Um, and like, why was my big crush out of that movie, Ethan Embry? What is that? What? Well, I look back at it now and I'm like, why him? Why was that the one? He, was, he was, he was, he was one of the guys at the moment, right? He was in White Squall too, that came out around that time, I think. And he, he was just one of those like JT2 looking. Yeah. Just kind dudes. of swirly and like, yeah unassuming i guess also like but... gentle maybe you yeah. know like i don't know he wasn't he wasn't my crush in it but i i can understand why that would be why that would I exist was, i was a kid yeah you know, you're I like i like you like... funny goofy cute little boy yeah. all right y'all we will want. what i said that's what you want but even like what's that guy from saturday night live that's dating the kardashian pete davidson yeah pete davidson it's that kind of like that that has wanting that guy because there's like it's like soft and emotional but like bde too is, mm -hmm. is has spanned generations okay y'all we'll be right back to share some freakouts the games and online harassment hotline is a text message based anonymous and confidential emotional support hotline and it's created specifically for the gaming community because we're gamers and creators and we want to help each other so how does it work well, you text us and we listen. Our hotline is 100% anonymous. We can talk about anything you need to and only what you want to. The Games and Online Harassment Hotline is an inclusive resource for anyone, no matter how you identify. If you feel that you need emotional support, you can start right now by texting SUPPORT to 23368 and our qualified responders will be there to listen to you, free of charge. Reach out, get help, and let's make this community a better place to work and play. Now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Anita, what's your freak out? Uh, I watched the best movie that's ever been made in the entire universe of movies. I'm listening. <laughs> it's called Tom Popo. Have you seen this? 
I've heard no. of it, but I okay. don't know anything about it. It is a Oh fuck, it's a Japanese No, it's a Japanese movie by uh Juzo Itami, I'm so sorry, from 1985, and it is a love story to ramen. <gasps> Oh, I've heard of this movie and I'm it always is told I have to watch this movie. Yes. So good. <laughs> it just, it is like, I don't really want to say a lot about it. Not that it's like spoilery or whatever, but it's just, it's an experience. Hmm. There's like all of these different ex- types of, the core story is about a, a single mother um, who has a ramen shop that's not good enough and she needs to get it good enough. Right. And around that story are all of these other kind of random stories and like relationships to food and like things that people do with food. It has one of the best sex scenes I've ever seen in my entire life. (laughs) And it's not the one that everybody talks about in the movie. Um, There's a thing with egg yolk that happens that people talk a lot about. That's not what I'm referring to. Um, Tama, no. Yeah. (laughs) There is... um, I so I love I've been I've been uh telling Kat that we need to do a series on food food movies because mm-hmm. I just am obsessed with thing like it. I have a, like... the perfect guest for you because I have a friend who is so obsessed with food movies as its own genre and nobody ever talks about Oh, I love that. Deep, yeah. Deep food I, movies. That's I just need to know about... this person. But so I love like the shots of making food, right? Yes. Like the shots. And so in this, I think has one of those that is so good and it's making a um a rice omelet and Mm. it's just like it's just perfect it's just perfect so i tom popo from 1985 itami is the director it is so fucking good i highly recommend it to anyone who likes movies or food on the list i won't watch it when i'm hungry because then i'll probably deliriously just order have a giant bowl of ramen yeah. while you're, eating, <laughs> while you're much, watching it. That's not a big mistake, ordering ramen. You're, that's you're true. Okay. No, that's that's a true. $12 financial disaster. You're, you're yeah. going to be all right. Um, I had, I was watching Bear. This is not my pickup, oh, but just a separate. Yeah. We the, love. The financial. Love. Like, yeah, but I watched it like, and I, I loved it too. I mean, like my brother committed suicide last month. So it was just like watching this movie was the wow. most bizarre. That's a lot. Wow. Yeah, it was a lot, but it was perfect. And it's one of those things where like mm-hmm. I've always, you know, whenever anybody like at a convention or something will be like, oh, this show changed my life or this this movie got me through a hard time. I'm like, you're just thinking of something that you want to say to like, mm-hmm. you know, what whoever. Um, but you hear it so often. But then this one, it was definitely me being like, oh, my God. This yeah. Is, this really helped get me through it. Uh, my point was, I, it was maybe 2 a.m. And I just wanted so badly while watching that movie, like a really rich broth. Some mm. kind of sticky broth. And I, like, searched all the apps to find a place that was open. And one Korean place was open. And I ended up ordering uh, the pork neck stew. And it was like $30 and it was a whole pig spine when it arrived. Uh, and the broth wasn't quite right, but that was, that was the thing where I'm like, I just wanted this broth and all I could find was a pig spine. <laughs> $30, $35, you know, pig spine still. Yeah. I deleted DoorDash after that. I'm done. It's got sure. Be but you know, not the, not the most, uh, like financially sinking, uh, impulse right. purchase. Well, as a binge eater, I've, I do it a lot. Oh. <laughs> and so, yeah. All right. yeah. I don't know. So, so maybe um, watching food movies is not the best for you sometimes. <laughs> I can do ramen. I can do one. I'm going to yeah. feel good about it. Yeah. And I, I think that what, eating ramen while watching this movie sounds like a great idea, but it's about perfecting ramen. And so mm. I feel like I'd be like, well, my ramen's not going to be good enough <laughs> for, for this, whatever. Anyways, watch the movie. It's so fucking good. I Have loved you it seen so much. Jiro dreams of sushi. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that whole part where he was like, an apprentice needs to work on the egg like alone for a year before we'll even talk to them about rice. You know, and I was like, yeah, that's what it takes. Um, so, Shaddy, was your freak out the pig spine? Uh, or did you have <laughs> I another love, freak if, out? If you have watch a pig spine. <laughs> no, my dog was happy. I, um, no, I think mine is older, but like maybe not enough cis people have seen Veneno. Mm. I was going to talk about 
I'm really only freaking out about the Sandman because I worked on the Sandman and I have got some stuff in development. So I'm mostly like not watching anything because I'm just working all the time. So that's coming out in a week, which won't make sense for when this podcast your your freak out could be overworking so completely obsessed. <laughs> well i'm just upset i want to see if people like it and i'm mm. really excited for all my coworkers, and so that's what i'm really thinking about but because i found out when this podcast is coming out i'm gonna go with the nano have you seen this movie no but it's been on my list to watch no. okay well it's not a movie yeah. first of all <laughs> isn't it isn't no, it the tv up. show I screwed up. yeah it's a tv show yeah it's yeah a, a tv show um uh it's on hbo max it's so good. It's the most like messy trans, but there's like this kind of um uh oh my god, am I I have ADHD. I, I lose words. Um magical realism stuff, right? It's a Spanish movie. And so there's this magical realism trans stuff and it's made by these like I think two gay directors who just really revere this trans woman and her legend. It's like the most transy thing I've ever seen and not made by trans people, but starring trans people. Mm. So it's kind of changed my politic because for a long time I was like, you know, trans folks should make their own cultural stories. But after this, I was like, or gay boys who love us, mm. <laughs> like who just like revere and love us in that sort of like taking this really sloppy, messy trans woman and like treating her like she's Cher or something like making making her iconic in the way that gay boys can do. But was she uh, oh, sorry, were there trans folks in like the writing team? I don't know. OK, because I like so I, I wonder if that's. I yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay. I, I usually am like, where's the money going? Because, you know, the right. on-screen representation of is, course. is something that everybody can do. But I was like, where's the money going? Laverne Cox hires a trans uh, makeup artist. You know, like like right. the, the math of like the, the branching things about like, and then she donated to this. And then that person gave this money to vent. You know, like where, to me, like the show business thing when it comes to representation is so much less about on-screen representation and the business side. Like where's mm -hmm. the money? Where is the money going? Does it go to these communities? When trans people make money, then it's like, you know, I'm going to donate to different Kickstarters or different GoFundMes for short films than like uh, the dude who does Euphoria, right? So, yeah. um, uh, but this, I, I kind of didn't care because it's so fantastic and like the most like actual transy, like, you know, the worst of the, the messiest trans person is revered and then everybody around her. And there's this one, tra there's, uh, this one trans woman in it who just eats a lot, you know, which I guess goes to your thing, but the, I just want to see a fat trans woman eating on camera like a lot more because that was the first time where i was like i felt seen in mm. a real way like i've i've been watching all these shows and it's just like oh that's not me and then finally i'm watching you know this woman like down well i can't wait till you have your own show and that's the protagonist it's so good that's watch all the hell I, out of that person eating yeah you know oh well as a component of the story <sighs> might be a hard sell i don't know if you you know the business is tough yeah that's yeah. true and I'm going to have nice. to watch this. I saw uh, Daniela Santiago, the actress from this, in uh, Parallel Mothers, Alma Duvar's long, complicated history of trans women <laughs> portrayed in his movies. Um, but she just was in, like, a scene. So, um, but you know, I know. A lot to watch. So, so good. Yeah. It's like, everyone needs to see it. Kat, what's, what, what, what are you freaking out about? So I think that Ingu on our Blade Runner episode mentioned the show Angeline on Peacock. And I finally watched all five episodes. Angeline was a fixture growing up in LA in the 90s, um, seeing her billboards, seeing sightings of Angeline and her pink Corvette and everything was uh, just a non-negotiable part of uh, the landscape of Los Angeles. Um and I've always been really hesitant to read like exposés about her because they've come up a little bit in the last 10, 15 years. And my feeling was always like, as far as I can tell, she's not hurting anybody and she doesn't want any one of us to know what the backstory is. So I was a little nervous about watching the show, but I did start it. And Emmy Rossum's performance was so good that I couldn't stop and I'm relieved to say that by the end of the movie, my at least my feeling as a viewer was that like, yes, we took a voyeuristic peek behind the curtain. We saw 
what could be presented as an objective reality of the person who was born and where where were they born? What was their name? How did they grow up? And we also are given Angeline's reality. And at the end of the show, I felt like I can comfortably let both of these realities coexist in my mind. Um, if she is all artifice, if she is a billboard queen alien from fairyland, I love it. Like that, then yes, that's true. That is also true. Um, and whether or not there was a child of Holocaust survivors who moved to Los Angeles and became the Angeline that we know is also part of that truth. And so it was like a really interesting, um, I mean, fantastic performances, uh, really impressive like makeup. Um, they do show people across decades. So there's like a lot of aging makeup that was, you know, that if that's bad, you take them right out of it. Um, but yeah, I was kind of blown away by it, actually. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine that I would see something that would satisfy like the Angeline story. And I will dis put a disclaimer that I have not, um, I have not read like if Angeline has given a statement about this particular series. She's been partially involved in different pieces of storytelling about her life over the years. Um, but I don't know if this is like a situation where she's completely condemned the show. I should have looked that up before freaking out about it, but that's where I'm at. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the shows that have come out lately about people like of, of various states of fame are like, fuck this shit. Fuck the way we've been represented and dramatized. Yeah, Pam and Tommy. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was definitely thinking about Pam and Tommy in the like re-traumatizing sense of it. Um, I think that this show, I mean, maybe it is a little bit of that magical realism that uh, the Spanish love, but like there's, there are enough ways where it's like, this is the story as we're telling you it is, but whether or not this thing actually happened, like, so, you know, there's like little artistic flourishes where you might see like 1984 or something as a title card, um, that probably five of years later. I, Tanya. Right. Where there's a lot of like, yeah. are, is this true? Is this not true? Is this a lie? Is this not a lie as a part of the storytelling? And is the, is there such a thing as an objective truth or reality? I mean, that's like the big question about our, our world and, yeah. our, you know, life, but like, uh, is there such a thing as an objective truth or is, is the memory of what happened the way you think it happened, the truth that matters? I, I think what's, I think that, that these are all great academic questions to ask. Uh, I, I think the problem is that Hollywood just exploits everybody. Right. Yeah. And so like that, so like, yeah, there's interesting ways to like tell these stories and consent is questionable in a lot of like the way they got Pam and Tommy was because they, they optioned a fucking article about right. the story. Right. Yeah. Like they didn't get Pamela Anderson's life rights as a, a way to tell this story. So I um, think that's what happened here too. They optioned a Hollywood reporter article. That's yeah. definitely what they're doing across the board. You're very healthy cat, by the way, mentally to be able to handle <laughs> the, the conflicting. So I couldn't watch it for that reason. And she did condemn yeah. it because it is, it is weird how many of these things are coming up, but even like winning time, which is this amazing. Have mm. you been watching winning time on HBO? I, yes. It's fantastic. It's so good. It's so, it's like such good filmmaking. It's like, it's perfect. It's beautiful. It's great. And I, like that i'm not even a sports person but i love sports movies and this is kind of a perfect one but they really have no they're just like really willy-nilly like it uh they, it totally. like they change the scores of the games they change the outcomes of games for mm. like a fact like it's really just like eh, not it's weird how untrue all this stuff was or inventing anna too was one where it's just like these disclaimers don't seem like enough i i the, the folks involved in this stuff should get a little, a little more, I think. Probably, I went to a a dem a like a a lecture given by a um a lawyer for a big film studio where she talked to like specifically talked about based on a true story. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's how nice. easy it is to just massage that language a little bit, and that's where you have those like creatively done things where it's like based on a true lie or um, 
the Cohen brothers saying something that's based on a true story that wasn't. Um, but then where you just say like inspired by real events or like all of those things that you can say that just legally cover your ass, but aren't necessarily ethical. Um, that's why yeah. it's so weird. Yeah. Uh, I hope nobody, well, nobody's interested in <laughs> stealing my life, but like, it's just, I, it's I will, creepy. I will but, save my future comments for the bonus. Because I have thoughts about this in yeah. terms of optioning life stories. Oh, man. I feel like I'm gonna... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose you do. I feel like I'm going to be up late tonight, like really uh, dark night of the soul thinking about how I spent five hours with the Angeline show. But you know what? Here's where we are. This is our show for today. This has been the season of cyberpunk, a cyberpunk summer recording. I'm sweating my butt off. It's great. I'm so sweaty. <laughs> Shaddy, thank you so much for joining us. Where thank can people you. find you on the I, internet? I'm just Shaddy Fatowski on everything. And uh, they can they can stream lots of your creative work. Yeah, watch the internet. It's a good show. <laughs> I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and you can find me at Anita Sarkeesian on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Kat Spada. You can find me at cat underscore ex underscore machina on twitter and you can follow feminist frequency at femfreak if you are a patreon subscriber be sure to stick around for the bonus episode with our guest shaddy Potoski. if you like this show please help other people find it subscribe rate comment and stick around because we're going to be back next season after a wee break Thanks Thank so you. much for listening. This ending is such a... We rough. don't know how to do this. We have in our script both, and, and then it, we just... It just happens, yeah, but... Yeah. Um, we will know. get our shit together for you all next season. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>